Draft Theses on National and Colonial Questions by Vladimir Lenin. Written on 5 June 1920 for the Second Congress of the Communist International. In submitting for discussion by the Second Congress of the Communist International the following draft theses on the national and the colonial questions I would request tall comrades, especially those who possess concrete information on any of these very complex problems, to let me have their opinions, amendments, addenda and concrete remarks in the most concise form, no more than two or three pages, particularly on the following points. Austrian experience. Polish Jewish and Ukrainian experience. Alsace-Lorraine and Belgium. Ireland. Danish-German, Italo-French and Italo-Slav relations. Balkan experience. Eastern peoples. The struggle against pan-Islamism. Relations in the Caucasus. The Bashka and Tatar republics. Kyrgyzstan, Turkestan, its experience. Negroes in America. Colonies. China, Korea, Japan. N. Lenin. June 5, 1920. 1. An abstract or formal posing of the problem of equality in general and national equality in particular is in the very nature of bourgeois democracy. Under the guise of the equality of the individual in general, bourgeois democracy proclaims the formal or legal equality of the property owner and the proletarian, the exploiter and the exploited thereby grossly deceiving the oppressed classes. On the plea that all men are absolutely equal, the bourgeoisie is transforming the idea of equality, which is itself a reflection of relations in commodity production, into a weapon in its struggle against the abolition of classes. The real meaning of the demand for equality consists in its being a demand for the abolition of classes. 2. In conformity with its fundamental task of combating bourgeois democracy and exposing its falseness and hypocrisy, the Communist Party, as the avowed champion of the proletarian struggle to overthrow the bourgeois yoke, must base its policy, in the national question too, not on abstract and formal principles but, first, on a precise appraisal of the specific historical situation and, primarily, of economic conditions, second, on a clear distinction between the interests of the oppressed classes, of working and exploited people, and the general concept of national interests as a whole, which implies the interests of the ruling class, third, on an equally clear distinction between the oppressed, dependent and subject nations and the oppressing, exploiting and sovereign nations, in order to counter the bourgeois democratic lies that lay down this colonial and financial enslavement of the vast majority of the world's population by an insignificant minority of the richest and advanced capitalist countries. A feature characteristic of the era of finance capital and imperialism. 3. The Imperialist War of 1914-18 has very clearly revealed to all nations and to the oppressed classes of the whole world the falseness of bourgeois democratic phrases, by practically demonstrating that the Treaty of Versailles of the celebrated Western democracies is an even more brutal and foul act of violence against weak nations than was the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk of the German Junkers and the Kaiser. The League of Nations and the entire post-war policy of the Entente reveal this truth with even greater clarity and distinctness. They are everywhere intensifying the revolutionary struggle both of the proletariat in the advanced countries and of the toiling masses in the colonial and dependent countries. They are hastening the collapse of the petty bourgeois nationalist illusions that nations can live together in peace and equality under capitalism. 4. From these fundamental premises it follows that the Communist International's entire policy on the national and the colonial questions should rest primarily on a closer union of the proletarians and the working masses of all nations and countries for a joint revolutionary struggle to overthrow the landowners and the bourgeoisie. This union alone will guarantee victory over capitalism, without which the abolition of national oppression and inequality is impossible. 5. The world political situation has now placed the dictatorship of the proletariat on the order of the day. World political developments are of necessity concentrated on a single focus, the struggle of the world bourgeoisie against the Soviet Russian Republic, around which are inevitably grouped, on the one hand, 
the Soviet movements of the advanced workers in all countries, and, on the other, all the national liberation movements in the colonies and among the oppressed nationalities, who are learning from bitter experience that their only salvation lies in the Soviet system's victory over world imperialism. 6. Consequently, one cannot at present confine oneself to a bare recognition or proclamation of the need for closer union between the working people of the various nations, a policy must be pursued that will achieve the closest alliance, with Soviet Russia, of all the national and colonial liberation movements. The form of this alliance should be determined by the degree of development of the communist movement in the proletariat of each country, or of the bourgeois democratic liberation movement of the workers and peasants in backward countries or among backward nationalities. 7. Federation is a transitional form to the complete unity of the working people of different nations. The feasibility of federation has already been demonstrated in practice both by the relations between the RSFSR and other Soviet republics, the Hungarian, Finnish 2, and Latvian 3, in the past and the Azerbaijan and Ukrainian at present, and by the relations within the RSFSR in respect of nationalities which formerly enjoyed neither statehood nor autonomy, for example, the Bashkir and Tatar autonomous republics in the RSFSR, founded in 1919 and 1920 respectively. 8. In this respect, it is the task of the Communist International to further develop and also to study and test by experience these new federations, which are arising on the basis of the Soviet system and the Soviet movement. In recognizing that federation is a transitional form to complete unity, it is necessary to strive for ever closer federal unity, bearing in mind, first, that the Soviet republics, surrounded as they are by the imperialist powers of the whole world, which from the military standpoint are immeasurably stronger, cannot possibly continue to exist without the closest alliance, second, that a close economic alliance between the Soviet republics is necessary, otherwise the productive forces which have been ruined by imperialism cannot be restored and the well-being of the working people cannot be ensured, third, that there is a tendency towards the creation of a single world economy, regulated by the proletariat of all nations as an integral whole and according to a common plan. This tendency has already revealed itself quite clearly under capitalism and is bound to be further developed and consummated under socialism. 9. The Communist International's national policy in the sphere of relations within the state cannot be restricted to the bare, formal, purely declaratory and actually non-committal recognition of the equality of nations to which the bourgeois democrats confine themselves, both those who frankly admit being such and those who assume the name of socialists, such as the socialists of the Second International. In all their propaganda and agitation, both within Parliament and outside it, the Communist parties must consistently expose that constant violation of the equality of nations and of the guaranteed rights of national minorities which is to be seen in all capitalist countries, despite their democratic constitutions. It is also necessary, first, constantly to explain that only the Soviet system is capable of ensuring genuine equality of nations, by uniting first the proletarians and then the whole mass of the working population in the struggle against the bourgeoisie, and, second, that all communist parties should render direct aid to the revolutionary movements among the dependent and underprivileged nations, for example, Ireland, the American Negroes, etc., and in the colonies, Without the latter condition, which is particularly important, the struggle against the oppression of dependent nations and colonies, as well as recognition of their right to secede, are but a false signboard, as is evidenced by the parties of the Second International. 10. Recognition of internationalism in word, and its replacement indeed by petty bourgeois nationalism and pacifism, in all propaganda, agitation and practical work, is very common not only among the parties of the Second International, but also among those which have withdrawn from it, and often even among parties which now call themselves communist. The urgency of the struggle against this evil, against the most deep-rooted petty bourgeois national prejudices, looms ever larger with the mounting exigency of the task of converting the dictatorship of the proletariat from a national dictatorship, that is, 
existing in a single country and incapable of determining world politics, into an international one, that is, a dictatorship of the proletariat involving at least several advanced countries, and capable of exercising a decisive influence upon world politics as a whole. Petty bourgeois nationalism proclaims as internationalism the mere recognition of the equality of nations, and nothing more. Quite apart from the fact that this recognition is purely verbal, petty bourgeois nationalism preserves national self-interest intact, whereas proletarian internationalism demands, first, that the interests of the proletarian struggle in any one country should be subordinated to the interests of that struggle on a worldwide scale, and, second, that a nation which is achieving victory over the bourgeoisie should be able and willing to make the greatest national sacrifices for the overthrow of international capital. Thus, in countries that are not already fully capitalist and have workers' parties that really act as the vanguard of the proletariat, the struggle against opportunist and petty bourgeois pacifist distortions of the concept and policy of internationalism is a primary and cardinal task. 11. With regard to the more backward states and nations, in which feudal or patriarchal and patriarchal peasant relations predominate, it is particularly important to bear in mind. First, that all communist parties must assist the bourgeois democratic liberation movement in these countries, and that the duty of rendering the most active assistance rests primarily with the workers of the country the backward nation is colonially or financially dependent on. Second, the need for a struggle against the clergy and other influential reactionary and medieval elements in backward countries. Third, the need to combat pan-Islamism and similar trends, which strive to combine the liberation movement against European and American imperialism with an attempt to strengthen the positions of the Khans, landowners, mullahs, etc., in the proofs Lenin inserted a brace opposite points 2 and 3 and wrote 2 and 3 to be united. Editor. Fourth, the need, in backward countries, to give special support to the peasant movement against the landowners, against landed proprietorship, and against all manifestations or survivals of feudalism, and to strive to lend the peasant movement the most revolutionary character by establishing the closest possible alliance between the West European communist proletariat and the revolutionary peasant movement in the East, in the colonies, and in the backward countries generally. It is particularly necessary to exert every effort to apply the basic principles of the Soviet system in countries where pre-capitalist relations predominate, by setting up working people's Soviets, etc. Fifth, the need for a determined struggle against attempts to give a communist coloring to bourgeois democratic liberation trends in the backward countries. The Communist International should support bourgeois democratic national movements in colonial and backward countries only on condition that, in these countries, the elements of future proletarian parties, which will be communist not only in name, are brought together and trained to understand their special tasks, that is, those of the struggle against the bourgeois democratic movements within their own nations. The Communist International must enter into a temporary alliance with bourgeois democracy in the colonial and backward countries, but should not merge with it, and should under all circumstances uphold the independence of the proletarian movement even if it is in its most embryonic form. Sixth, the need constantly to explain and expose among the broadest working masses of all countries and particularly of the backward countries, the deception systematically practiced by the imperialist powers, which, under the guise of politically independent states, set up states that are wholly dependent upon them economically, financially and militarily. Under present-day international conditions there is no salvation for dependent and weak nations except in a union of Soviet republics. 12. The age-old oppression of colonial and weak nationalities by the imperialist powers has not only filled the working masses of the oppressed countries with animosity towards the oppressor nations, but has also aroused distrust in these nations in general, even in their proletariat. The despicable betrayal of socialism by the majority of the official leaders of this proletariat in 1914-19 when defense of country was used as a social chauvinist cloak to conceal the defense of the right of their own bourgeoisie to oppress colonies and fleece financially dependent countries, 
was certain to enhance this perfectly legitimate distrust. On the other hand, the more backward the country, the stronger is the hold of small-scale agricultural production, patriarchalism and isolation, which inevitably lend particular strength and tenacity to the deepest of petty bourgeois prejudices, that is, to national egoism and national narrow-mindedness. These prejudices are bound to die out very slowly, for they can disappear only after imperialism and capitalism have disappeared in the advanced countries, and after the entire foundation of the backward country's economic life has radically changed. It is therefore the duty of the class-conscious communist proletariat of all countries to regard with particular caution and attention the survivals of national sentiments in the countries and among nationalities which have been oppressed the longest. It is equally necessary to make certain concessions with a view to more rapidly overcoming this distrust and these prejudices. Complete victory over capitalism cannot be won unless the proletariat and, following it, the mass of working people in all countries and nations throughout the world voluntarily strive for alliance and unity.